I do want to join in this morning with Gary in welcoming those who are visiting with us. We're thankful for your presence. We have a large number here today, and we're thankful for that. And we're thankful for those from this community, as well as those from area congregations who have come uh, to be with us today. We invite you to open your Bibles, if you will, to Psalm 127, verses 3 through 5, will be the text for our lesson. As we talk about children, arrows in the hands of a mighty man. I remember a number of years ago when I was living in Alabama that I was asked to be a counselor at a nearby camp. And a part of my duties for that camp was to oversee the archery that took place in the afternoons. And I like to hunt and I like to be outdoors. And so I, I was excited about that assignment. I thought that would be a fun assignment. And I wondered how it was that I came to get that assignment. After all, this was my first year to be at that camp, and I would have thought one of the other men at the camp would have wanted that assignment, but they gave it to me. But it didn't take me long to determine why they gave that assignment to me. The first time one of the children with a bow and the arrow already on the string turned and pointed it at me and said, How do you shoot this? I knew instantly why I got that assignment. And so all week long, I held my breath, afraid that someone was going to get shot, most of all me. But I was concerned about that. We got through the week. No one got shot. Some close calls, but that was it. There was a frog that died during the week. One of the arrows found its way somehow off course, and a frog happened to be in the path. That was the celebrated kill of the week. Uh, the young person that did that was very, very excited about it. But I, that was okay. Uh, a frog dying is okay, but a child getting hurt wasn't. But we made it through the week. There is a passage in the, in the Psalms that, of all things, connects children and arrows together. And it is Psalm 127, and verses 3 through 5, where the psalmist says, Children are in heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hands of a mighty man, so are the children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them, for they shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. And so here in this passage, we have a beautiful picture being drawn of a mighty man, of a warrior, and his children are described as the arrows in his hand. And he is said to be blessed. He is said to be happy if his quiver is full of those arrows. Now you would assume that a mighty man has the strength to be able to pull back his bow. If he is in fact a warrior, then he knows how to handle that bow and he can direct his arrow to where he wants it to go. And that's the picture that's being drawn here. Of the father who has the strength to pull back his arrow, pull back his children, and direct them where he wants them to go. And so we want to talk about what is required in being a great archer and what is required in being a great parent in getting our children safely to the target that God has for them. First of all, it requires knowledge. It requires knowledge. When I was instructing and overseeing archery at that camp, it was obvious which children had knowledge of the bow. Which children had a bow at home. Which children had put an arrow on that string before. That was obvious. For one thing, they didn't turn and point the bow at you, asking you how to shoot it. But for another thing, they knew how to handle it. They knew how to use it. And most of the time, they could hit the target. Because it wasn't the first time they had ever tried to do that. Knowledge. Being a great archer requires knowledge. The better you know the bow, the better you know the arrow, the better you know all of those things, the more successful you are in getting that arrow to his target. And the same is true of parents. The better they know their children, the better they're going to be able to direct those children in the way that they ought to go. That's what Proverbs 22 and verse 6 is all about. 
But not only do they need to know their children, and not only do they need to know other things, they need to know the Word of God. The Word of God is the standard by which they are to live their lives, and the standard by which their children are to live their lives. It is the parenting manual that they need the most. They need to know the book. In Matthew chapter 7, in verses 24 through 27, Jesus is going to tell a parable. And in this parable, He is going to describe those that hear His sayings and do them, and those who hear His sayings but don't do them. And He's going to liken the man that hears these sayings and does them to a wise man that built his house upon the rock. The rains descend, the floods come, the winds beat upon that house, and it stands firm, for it's founded on a rock. The foolish man... He's building his house upon the sand. The rains come, the floods rise, the winds blow, and it falls. And great is the fall of it, for it was founded upon the sand. Now Luke, in the parallel account of this parable, would tell us that this man built his house without foundation. Because when you're building your house upon the sand, you're building your house without a foundation. Without a foundation that will last or will stand. And so if we want to get our arrows safely to the target, then we're going to have to have some knowledge of how to do that. If we're going to build a foundation, build a home that's going to withstand the trials and the tests of this life, and there will be many, then we're going to have to know the Word of God. Or it won't stand the test of time. A number of years ago, there was a hurricane that hit the coast of Florida. And it did a great deal of damage. And a reporter was out covering the damage, and he went to one of the communities that was hardest hit. And as he made his way through that community, he saw devastation everywhere. But there was one house that had barely been touched. And he saw the resident of that house standing in the front yard, and he stopped and he talked to him, and he said, Sir, how can you explain this? How can you explain that your house is virtually undamaged when all the houses around you, all the houses of your neighbors have been destroyed. And he said, the only answer I have to give you is that I built my house according to the code. You see, the state of Florida has a hurricane code and it suggests this type of lumber and it suggests this type of bracing and it suggests this type of construction should be able to weather a hurricane to this level. And I built my house according to that code. And that's the only way that I can account for my house being in the condition that it is right now. Now the question for each of us as parents is, are we building our house according to the code? Are we building our house according to the guidelines that God's given in His Word? You see, the rains are going to descend, the floods are going to come, the winds are going to blow. That's a given in life. It's going to happen. The question is whether or not our house, our home, is going to withstand those strong winds. Whether or not they are going to remain virtually undamaged because we're building according to the code that God has given to us. But in the second place, in order to be a great archer, In order to be a great parent, it requires time. It was obvious which of those children had spent time at home using the bow. Which of them practiced on a regular basis. The more they practiced, the better they were. It's true of a lot of things in life. It's true of archery as well. Just recently in taking a walk with with the kids, we saw a man in the front yard and he had his bow. And he was practicing shooting that bow. And he shot it over and over again in the course of the time that we were walking past. He was practicing. It takes a great deal of practice. It takes a great deal of time to be successful at that. In like manner, to be a parent, it requires a great deal of time. The Bible says in Ephesians 5 and verse 16, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Literally buying up the time. You don't have very much time, and so you have to buy up the time that you have. It may even involve, and sometimes it does, buying back the time that you have to be able to use it in a wiser way than that which you had planned for it. Sometimes we overcommit 
ourselves. Sometimes we, we, we say, yes, I'll do this, and yes, I'll do this, and yes, I'll do that. And before we realize it, we've committed ourselves to all of these things. And then the things that are really important in life, the things that really matter, the things that are going to have eternal consequences, we've kind of deprived them of time in order to do these other things. And so sometimes we have to buy back that time from these things that are inconsequential and, and buy them back for things that matter. Parents have to do that. They have to redeem or buy up the time that they have to spend with their children. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verses 6 and 7, there in that context, Moses is instructing the fathers, instructing the parents, that the things that he's teaching them are to first and foremost be in their hearts, but then they are to teach them diligently to their children. They are to talk of them when they walk in the way, when they rise up, when they lie down, when they go out, and when they come in. They're supposed to be talking of these things. Now that passage suggests a great amount of time that's invested in these children, that these children are there with them as they go through life, as they do these things in life, their children are there with them, and their children are being taught, both in word and by example. That's time. A great deal of time is required to be successful in raising children. In Malachi chapter 4 and verse 6, it's interesting that the Old Testament ends with this idea. The New Testament, at least Luke's gospel, begins with it. It is the idea that there is one coming along likened to Elijah, the great powerful prophet. That one likened to Elijah is going to be John the Baptist. And he is going to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers lest God come and smite the land with a curse. John the Baptist was going to have the role of turning the hearts of the fathers back to the children and of turning the hearts of the children back to the fathers. Because fathers and children can grow apart. Fathers can get involved in other things. Their time can be spent in other things. And there's a great divide that can develop between them and their children. And so John the Baptist, a part of him, a part of his work in preparing the road for Christ, in preparing the way for Christ, was to get the fathers and the children back together. It was to get the fathers to concentrate and focus back on their children again, to get the children back again to listening and following their, their fathers. You want to prepare the way for the spread of the gospel into the next century? You know how to do that? By getting the fathers and the children together. By getting the fathers to spend the time and to show the affection and the love to their children and to get the children to again look with respect to their fathers. And you will prepare the way for the kingdom of our Lord to be successful for years and years to come in the future. John the Baptist understood that. He understood that was a part of what his work was. We need to understand that's a part of what our work is. Heard the story of a missionary who came home for the summer. Supporting congregation had made arrangements for him to have a house on a lake. For him to be able to rest during the summer, to go and raise support and do the things that he, that he needed to do. But mainly just to rest before he went back to the mission field. And the father was out and he was getting his fishing gear ready and his two daughters were out playing in the yard and his young son was out playing in the yard. And as he was in there working on all of his fishing gear, he heard the two girls screaming and he runs out and he sees them pointing to the lake. There's a boat that's tied to a pier. He knows instantly what's happened. His young son has tried to get into the boat and has fallen into the water. The father rushes, not being able to see the sun. He dives off the pier. He begins to search the bottom frantically for his son. He doesn't find it. He comes up for air and he goes down immediately. Begins to fill around and still cannot find his son. But as he's making his way up along the pier, one of the posts of the pier, he feels something. It's his son. He grabs him. He brings him to the top. When he realizes that his son's still okay, he asks his son, Son, what were you doing down there? What were you doing holding on to that post of the pier? And his son said, just waiting on you, Dad. Just waiting on you. And there are countless children who are just waiting on you, Dad. 
that are just waiting on you, Mom, that need your help, that need your influence, that need you to spend time with them. And if you don't do that, they're not going to make it. If you don't do that, they're not going to survive. But if you're willing to, to put them first, and you're willing to put time and effort into them, then they can make it. But it requires time. Think about it as well in the third place, that to be a great archer, to be a great parent, it requires strength. I don't know if you've ever tried to pull a bow back or not, but bows can be very hard to pull back. We, we live in a day and age of compound bows, and you pull the bow back, and when you get to a certain point, it breaks. It's easier to pull again. But until you get it to that point, it's very, very hard. And so you have to be very strong in order to be able to pull back that string. You, you want a bow that's hard to pull back. You want a bow that, that requires some strength to pull because the arrow will fly further and further to pull the string back to give you greater distance, greater speed, greater accuracy. And so to be an archer, you have to be strong. In like manner, to be a parent, you have to be strong. It takes strength to be a parent, especially in our day and age. In a day and age which there are so many challenges to the home and so many dangers to your children, if your children are going to make it, you're going to have to be strong. The Bible says as much. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 23, we read of the parents of Moses. It says, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw that he was a proper child. And they feared not the commandment of the king. Here are Moses' parents. Children that are born are put to death. They know that. But they're, they've determined, they've made up their mind, that's not going to happen to our son. We're going to hide our son. We're going to protect our son. We're going to find a way to save our son. We don't care if this is what's happening to every other son in the world. Our son's going to be different. We can't control all of that, but we can control this. And they determined that it's not going to happen to their son. So they do everything they can for the first three months. For some reason, they reach a point to where they can't go any further. I don't know if the child was, was getting bigger and as a result, harder to hide. I don't know if some neighbor had detected the presence of the child. I don't know what happened. But for some reason, they had determined this is as far as they could go in hiding the child. But even when the first option had been removed, they were determined we'll find another way. So they make this ark of bulrushes, they formulate this plan whereby their son can be saved and it works because of the providential care of God and the baby is saved. The mother even gets to be uh, the nurse for the child. Everything works out. But Amram and Jochebed had to be strong. That wasn't something that weak parents would have done or could have done. It was something only strong parents would do. Only strong parents would risk their lives for the sake of this child. Only strong parents would, would formulate this plan and have faith great enough to carry out this plan. They were strong. What about Joshua? In Joshua 24 and verse 15, Joshua said, If it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood or the God of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Here's Joshua. Joshua is a strong father. And Joshua says, as for me and my house, this is the way it's going to be. We're going to serve the Lord. We've made this choice. We're going to follow through with this choice. You've got to make your choice, but here is ours. And we've made it whether you make it or not. We make it whether or not you're going to do it or not. This is what we're going to do. That's a strong father, a strong parent. That's the kind of parents that are needed in this day and age as well. But think about in the fourth place. In order to be a great archer, to be a great parent, it requires vision. Vision. My eyesight's not as good as it used to be. And so there are things that I used to do that I can't do as well as I used to do them. Not only am I older, but my eyesight's not as good. And so that affects it. But in order to be a great archer, you have to have great eyesight. You have to be able to see the target. You have to be able to see it well. You have to be able to look down the arrow to be able to put the arrow where you want it to go. You have to have great vision. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 2 says, Set your affection on things above and not on things on the earth. There Paul's talking about the vision. 
that Christians have to have. And the vision is they have to be able to see beyond this right here in front of them. They have to be able to see beyond the earth, which is all around them. And they have to be able to set their affection on things above. They have to be able to see beyond this life to the next life. See beyond this earth to heaven that awaits. They have to be able to have that kind of vision. In Philippians 3 and verse 14, he says, But I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul said, I can see the target, and I am pressing, I am focused on that target and getting there. Fathers and mothers have to be focused on that target and getting their children there. Some of you perhaps are familiar with the Battle of Agincourt. It was fought on October the 25th, 1415. It's one of the greatest battles in military history. It was fought between the English and the French. King Henry V, Englishman, won a great victory on that day. Now his troops were outnumbered greatly. And they had been decimated by disease, and so no one expected them to put up very much of a fight. The French were expected to carry the day. But in this battle, 10,000 French knights were killed. Only 113 Englishmen were killed. How do you account for that? What was the difference? The difference was the English longbow. The English archers were so good that the French never got close enough to fight the kind of battle that they were used to fighting. They were used to fighting a hand-to-hand -hand battle. And they had the numbers to literally overwhelm the English in that kind of a battle. But they never got close enough to be able to do that. Because the English archers picked them off one by one. Every surge was met with the resistance of the archers. And history records that if a French knight ever lifted his visor on the field of battle, he did not live to put it down again. 350 yards or less, he didn't live to put it down again. They literally hit him in the face with an arrow if he lifted his visor. Can you imagine the kind of vision that is required to be able to do that? 350 yards? I couldn't hit a barn from that distance. Much less hit someone's a circle about that big. It's amazing to consider the vision that they had. That's the kind of vision we need for parents to have. Vision that's able to see the goal in the distance. You see, we get so caught up on...